Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I get started, I just want to say this conference has been uh, honestly uh, super inspirational. Um, it's really um, exciting to see everyone here come together, and I just truly do believe that UX really does touch all aspects of the game industry, and frankly, beyond. beyond. And so I'm here to present my talk, Back to the UX Future, and that's my title, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Okay, so, um, oops. Oh, did I just click something? Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, you might know me as the obstacle in the Frogger variant game called Varmints, or as the bedraggled puppy shop styling owner um, in this forgettable game. <laughs> These are all my games, so I can say this. And I'm also the voice of the yellow QBs in the game of the same title. Uh, but seriously, so my name is Margaret Wallace, and uh, I've been in the game industry. Okay, I'm gonna tell you for how long, I don't usually admit it. I've been in the game industry since 1996. And I've had a lot of, worn a lot of hats, and I kind of describe myself as an entrepreneur, inventor, designer, but truthfully, in many of my companies, I have also been the UX person, just by default, and then because it's also a passion of mine. Uh, I got my, I'm gonna go try to zip through the biographical stuff, but I hope it's relevant to you. So uh, I got my start uh, way back when at a company called PF Magic. You had to work at PF Magic for a year before they told you what PF stood for. And we created the games Cats and Dogs. And Cats and Dogs is, vir one of the, is the first virtual pet game in existence, as far as I know, before Tamagotchi, before all that Pokemon. Um, and it's still in existence today. It's still around. I think the last iteration of um, Dogs and Cats, which is now owned by Ubisoft, uh, was in 2014. So I'm really proud of that fact. And the reason I'm bringing up PF Magic as sort of um, the first thing, I know it's super long ago, I don't really like to, I'm very anti-nostalgia in general, but really I learned a lot of amazing things there that I've carried throughout my career. Uh, these were, this was half the company at the time. Notice something interesting? <laughs> so I'm in the front, I really wish I still had that shirt. And, uh, and you know, I was uh, just thinking about this a little bit li earlier today, and besides me, none of those people are in games anymore. And the blonde woman is the only one who is remotely involved in tech, doing UX stuff for that matter. Uh, then I went on to um, do some other stuff with Mattel and a company called Shockwave. And then I founded my first uh, game studio called Skunk Studios. I'm proud to say they're still in existence today, even though I'm not really a part of it anymore. Um, and then I went on to found a company called Rebel Monkey, which raised um, several million dollars. I raised several million dollars, and I had a lot of interesting lessons there. Um, still interesting to point out all these years later, and again, I'm not trying to um, alienate the audience or get, get, get political, I just think it just speaks to all of us, you know, all of us uh, female founders still get 2% of all venture capital dollars. Um, and um, I'm usually a speaker at business conferences, so this is really exciting. Uh, I do pull this uh, fact out at the business conferences as much as I can when we're in the middle of talking monetization, monetization, blah, blah, blah. I will mention that every now and then. And I just, and um, then I went on to um, Rebel Monkey Fold It, where we reincorporated, same company. Um, so technically, Revel Monkey is still in existence. And then I co-founded Playmatix, and I was the CEO of Playmatix for about nine years. It's still in existence. I'm still a co-founder, 50% owner. Um, these are just some of the examples of some of the folks we worked with. Um, you know, pretty broad range of branded entertainment games, um, uh, serious games, and then real-world games, all on incredibly ridiculous budgets that, you know, we couldn't possibly do everything we wanted to do, and, and that's an interesting thing to consider when we're talking about stuff like accessibility and, and how important that is to build in from the outset and just planning properly, honestly. Um, but at the time, at Playmatics, we did get to work with the Canadian Film Commission, so I'm proud of that, and I'm really, really excited to be in Canada and that you guys let me in. And um, <laughs> didn't build the wall yet. And uh, Vancouver is a beautiful city from what I've seen so far. 
And, uh, and then some of the stuff that we worked on that is um, you know, game related, this is a project we partnered with Jane McGonigal on called Find the Future, where we turned the uh, New York Public Library into an overnight at the museum scavenger hunt event, and there was a companion app. So lots of user ex experience issues to work out and maybe not work out so well regarding technology and interaction with technology and, and museums that don't have good wireless connections and all that kind of stuff, or um, libraries in this case. And then I raised um, some money uh, with the Swiss investors to and partnered with a, uh, an organization called the Millennium Institute to do a game called Shadow Government, raised a million dollars, and it, it failed. And it failed for lots of reasons, but the only reason I'm mentioning this here, here is because I really felt like we were onto something really interesting. What we did is we used real world data to power gameplay. And honestly, as far as user experience goes, what really went wrong with Shadow Government was that, um, Nobody could really settle on what the final user experience was going to be. And so if you plug in uh, you know, climate variables and economic variables, it will supposedly, and I think it does, uh, spit out results about um, what the prognosis is for the health of a country and what it might be. So you could really play around with that, and we thought that would be a really wonderful thing. But it was really hard, I think, for all of us, and I take responsibility, um, to really think of um, how to encapsulate that. I was pushing it more into a uh, matrix kind of direction, as you can see, and, um, and I think the investors really wanted it to be more um, you know, serious-minded, but they weren't sure, and anyway, so, and in fact, the investors came up with the name Shadow Government because it was, um, the purpose of the game was to shadow the government. And again, speaking of user experience, um, just culturally speaking, it makes sense why um, in Switzerland, I, I happen to speak German, that makes perfect sense, Schattenregierung, make, makes perfect sense, but it did not translate to other markets. So it was really a confusing user experience, not only for the creators, but for all of us. Um, so I was pretty disillusioned <laughs> with raising investment money and private investment after that. And then um, we kind of uh, had to diversify as a company, and this is Playmatics. And I know I'm going to use a word that I know um, is pretty unpopular, but we switched to, we, we switched, we diversified. We also incorporated gamification as sort of our, um, sort of leading the charge around that. And why? Well, because people paid us to do that. But also, I, I think, you know, gamification has a bum rap and it deserves it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what people are trying to say, and it's still used all the time um, in industry, is what they're really trying to say when they're saying gamification, I think you all know this, is they're talking about user experience, right? And so, so from that point, um, you know, we, we started uh, getting a lot of attention around gamifying your life and quantified self and tracking everything. And, um, and then from there, I spent some time at BBC, working on a massively online multiplayer game for Doctor Who. Uh, and this was an interesting user experience because, as you can see, um, this was multiplayer, it was online. And, you know, uh, as you know, the complexity around user experience grows exponentially when you're talking about online communities, online communities interacting with each, with each other, a brand that is uh, both family friendly, considered more family friendly in certain countries and other countries more appealing to college age people. And so um, there, there was a lot of complexity with that user experience um, for better or for worse and I, I learned a fair amount there. And then right now I have a company called, um, right now I uh, have gone indie. I still have those comp the company in New York City, Playmatics. But I live in San Francisco, and right now my company is called Kijiko, and I sort of felt like I wanted to take what I've done sort of with one studio and then work with others, just a bunch of studios, or just get, a, get more of a range of experience, and plus commuting back to New York all the time was kind of a drag. And I think uh, you as an audience know better than most that um, one thing that's amazing about games is that it is really a sandbox for exploring all sorts of interactivity and um, experiences. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how much the game industry has always led the way 
in, in so many things in terms of innovation and technology. When people want to try things out, uh, they will often come to the game industry, or we just do it ourselves. And then those things get um, sort of per percolate throughout uh, other areas of industry or interactivity or um, play, for that matter. And so uh, I won't spend too much time going through this because I think you all um, understand this because of who you are and what you do. But honestly, really at the end of the day, UX uh, really just wants to create, a, uh, enable a pleasure experience um, when you're interacting with a game or with some kind of um, uh, intention, intentional play, for example. Now, this is a really challenging thing, and I think a lot of us have already spoken about this um, a lot um, over this conference, is uh, game design, UI, and UX design must work together in tandem, right? Uh, understatement of the whole conference. Uh, and it really, you know, it's funny. It took me some time myself as a studio owner and uh, to realize that you can have the most amazing game designers, or, and I consider myself kind of a game designer, the, the most amazing UI folks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the UX will, will uh, happen, right? And I feel like I've learned that the hard way and also the easy way. Um, and so like when you look at immersion, one of the early lessons I learned at um, PF Magic, just to kind of bring it back to this company, is that, um, is that we took sort of the Disney approach to immersion. We didn't want, uh, we wanted the, the pets to seem as real as they possibly could. And it was a pretty big hit game. And at the time, I was also um, in charge of, from the publisher side, overseeing a game called Creatures. Now, Creatures, I think, is still around. But Creatures took a very different tack, right, on, um, on at virtual life that was much more scientific, much more scientifically driven and correct. But I would wager that, uh, that this sort of had more of a lasting uh, reach and potential impact on audiences. So it's just interesting, like, uh, UX really is about uh, exposing sort of what, what, we, what we want to um, provide um, to, to give a good experience, but sometimes when you get too much under the hood, that's just my criticism, it, it's, it's interesting to a smaller subset, and that's awesome, but it may not be the impact that you want. So I just think that's an interesting juxtaposition there. And then, of course, we, talked, we spoke a lot about um, already designing for inclusion, so I don't even mean to pretend to um, approximate what's come before in terms of these discussions. But uh, you know, the, obviously UX is concerned with that, and then who is being excluded? And um, the panel, a couple panels earlier, there was a comment about um, color, color blindness. So this game board here, right? That was a month of my life arguing with <laughs> my co-founders at the time because we would have users just writing us saying, I love your game, but I, I can't play certain games because I'm, I'm colorblind and all of these tones of blue, they all just look the same to me. And it was, um, it was a pretty heated uh, debate among the co-owners who said it was a feature. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a problem, it's not a usability issue. It's a feature, it's meant to be that way. And so, anyway, uh, but you know, I think as all, as designers, right, I think we walk through life, you know, when I was working on the dogs and cats, I kept seeing real dogs and cats walking around and I kept seeing them as 3D models, <laughs> you know? And I think as designers, I think we do that, right? Like I th we think we, uh, when we're crossing the street, it feels like, you know, sometimes it's a game. And we also look at design and we're all evaluating design all the time. I'm, I'm speaking for you, but um, I would assume some of you are like that. I know I'm like that. And, I have this phrase, like, when design says, you know, the heck with you, I use a curse. But, um, <laughs> and so it was really funny when I was um, trying to get into, through customs, coming here for the conference, I, you know, these, you, there are these really cool automated customs check-in uh, machines, and I was like, this is cool. But when it came time to take my photo, I'm too short. <laughs> and so, uh, the machines kept trying to, like, saying, we can't get your photo, and I kept jumping 
hoping, <laughs> hoping the machine would catch it and I would get a piece of my hair. And I ended up having to go through extra screening because the machine couldn't um, capture my image because it really didn't take to account people of small stature such as myself. Uh, and, you know, how many of us remember going to uh, game conferences where the only size shirt were extra, 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 extra large? Um, I got in trouble in one of my earlier jobs at Shockwave uh, at 1GDC because we were all supposed to wear the shirts, but it came down to here to me and I was like, I feel like I'm a five-year-old walking around, but anyway. So I think as an industry, we've come a long way in terms of addressing those issues. And, and these are sort of lighthearted, except the, the colorblind example, lighthearted examples, but, but just, just as a sense of, um, just in terms of user experience, right? I mean, our whole lives are a user experience on one level or another, right? And to me, this is sort of how I walk around my world and I, I think of these things. And then, of course, flow uh, is something that you all contend with a lot in creating games and other interactive experiences. And one of the interesting examples I thought I would provide here, I'm not allowed to, <laughs> but I thought, oh, well, nobody will really know um, that I'm showing this, because that was one of my challenges, was uh, speaking to this audience. Uh, a little intimidating. I feel like you've done so much, and so much of what I'm working on, I'm not allowed to show. Um, this one project is um, called Wonder Aquarium. And I know that's a lot of text. That's on purpose. Uh, this is a project that uh, was part of um, a national U.S. National Institute of Health funded project. And it was, um, you know, these scientists came to us and said, these neuroscientists came to us and I work with a lot of them. I joke, I joke, on the, um, I joke to my friends in San Francisco, if you throw a penny out, out the window, chances are it'll hit a neuroscientist on the head because we just have a lot of neuroscientists. But they came to us and they said, these are our goals. These are the clinical goals we're going to be testing uh, out. Can you make a game around that? So, you know, okay, um, pretty dry stuff. And so I came up, um, I came up uh, with the idea of using sort of an aquarium metaphor. Did a bunch of research because uh, the, the clinical trial in terms of flow isn't going to necessarily flow like a game, right? There are going to be stops and starts. There are going to be weird transitions because these scientists have to measure certain things around focus and attention. And I was like, well, in terms of a user experience, what can we do to make it the most accessible? So we came up with, or I came, I came up with, this, the aquarium metaphor um, because I thought it would be the most accessible. So the game pretty much was measuring several things, um, speed, accuracy, and the ability to sequence things, and also the ability to change directions. And so to do, uh, so in this example here, your goal is to feed that hungry fish by tapping it after it glows. And then maybe in other successive levels, you were supposed to refrain from tapping on the fish if it glows, for example. And we would test this down to the millisecond in terms of efficacy. See all this stuff, baseline, all these baseline stuff. Um, and yeah, here's the one where you're supposed to withhold um, action. So uh, don't tap on the fish, uh, don't tap uh, even when they glow. So only you know, tap on the red fish. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, but it was really interesting because this does not play like a normal game does, but we still have the same challenges as user experience designers and game designers to ensure that the, the cohort or the people who are, being, um, who are using this in clinical trials are, um, are still playing the game. So it was, a, it was a challenge, but again, it just speaks to how user experience um, may have different priorities depending on, on the context and the setting. Uh, yeah, here's another one. Like, you will learn to be aware of your attention. Like, oh, it's just, it's just such a, you know, it's just such a flow breaker, but we had to put that in there because we needed a self-assessment um, module as we went along. Anyway, uh, I'm also not allowed to say this. Apparently, um, the scientist is going to publish uh, a journal uh, article, in, I think, in Nature, 
about the outcomes of this, of this study. So we'll see. Uh, I've, I've learned that the scientific community has the luxury to move much more slowly than we do in tech and games, right? Uh, and I think this was very well covered um, yesterday and, I'm, and, and throughout this whole conference about how UX really allows a person, a player, to navigate complicated scenarios and gameplay terrains. And then, on top of that, we have to design for so many multiple experiences. And, uh, you know, uh, this is just a very basic um, av avatar chat sort of room, essentially, with moving avatars. And what kinds of emergent behavior come out of that? Uh, and then, you know, just the whole idea of the community management and, you know, what tools are you able to use to invest in managing communities? Uh, when, when we made this, uh, we didn't have access to a lot of the tools, but, but I've spoken with a lot of folks um, who are really increasingly interested in using AI to help um, manage community dynamics, for better or for worse. Um, Intel, for example, I think they're really big on exploring that, for example. Um, and then this is an example of cooperative gameplay. So again, the complexity just goes even higher because it's real time, it's cooperative, it's team based, and you know you have to account for um, you know player matching and what that's like and what the user experience is like if a, if a player drops out, what do you do if they abandon their team, how do team points get um, allocated that's more of a game design but I mean I think a lot of this the user experience stuff does get intermingled with that. Um, and then in terms of designing for different you know, scenarios, I mean, now we have um, obviously the world of streaming, which is really cool and compelling. But I mean, I think it, it must inform UX decisions at, because in some ways it just adds another sort of channel or, or level of engagement and also viewership. So you know, how do you incorporate the knowledge that you know your game is likely to be streamed, and you know it's surprising uh, what uh, viewers you know who aren't even playing the games obviously are interested in, in watching. You know it's it's obvious that you know Hearthstone um, streams are, are are popular, but you know I talked to this one um, game creator named Attila Schatzner, and he created a citizen science game off of the Eve Online engine. And he was telling me how it's an incredibly popular uh, Twitch stream. There's, there are a couple of players who just show their very um, sort of laborious uh, uh, you know, citizen science activities within the EVE Online world. So it's just interesting as far as user experience goes in terms of having to take this, the streaming culture and I would imagine on some level influencers into account and how that plays out into user experience um, in terms of a lot of ways. Obviously, good user experience economizes on effort, and also um, you don't really want people to have to struggle to figure out what they're supposed to do where, right? Obvious. So here's an example of um, a mock-up, and I can, I can criticize it, I own it. Uh, here's an example of a mock-up that uh, a really wonderful artist of, that, who worked for me did for this um, project that is still in development. Doesn't look anything like this anymore. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I kept saying to him, you know, I know Pokemon Go is a really successful title, but the way this, this screen looks to me, and, you know, after we tested it out, I, I was right, because I'm so cool. Uh, this looks like it's a location-based game, or it looks like I'm going to be walking around and just tapping on these different locations, to me at least, and to the people we tested it out on. You know, and that's a, that's a, and the art director did not agree, and the game designer did not agree, and they didn't see it, and they didn't believe me, and okay, they shouldn't because I'm not the, necessarily the audience, but when you put it in front of people. So good UX is, you know, doesn't create friction, right? Doesn't create friction between the user and the experience. And then, um, of course, choices have to be transparent. But again, you don't 
want to expose the system, right? The system, unless it's part of the game. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I when it's working on the pets product. Um, speaking of exposing the system, the community figured out how to how to hack the pets files for dogs and creating dogs and cats because we were not releasing um, breeds of dogs and cats uh, fast enough, and so this whole community of users figured out how to hack our our files, and um, and it was really a lot of girls were doing it which was kind of interesting. Um, and so we made the choice to, uh, you know, as part of the user experience of the community, to allow the system to be exposed. What we really should have done is we should have given them tools to make their own pets because they really labor to make um, rabbits out of the cat files or cat dogs. <laughs> and we really should have enabled that kind of creativity. Um, but in general, you don't want to um, overwhelm people with information. Uh, and of course, in the world we're in right now, uh, it's increasingly gesture, gesture reliant, right? Um, it's just amazing how much our world has sort of expanded on that front. And you know, these are some screenshots I just grabbed from, uh, from the Twitter. Uh, a lot of attention happening right now at the Oculus um, conference, but just in general, uh, it just adds a layer of complexity. Um, not only for the user experience within the game, but also sort of around the surrounding environment. Um, you know, uh, is my game going to cause somebody to, you know, fall down the stairs, or what can I do? Um, stuff like that. And then, yeah, the movement must fit with expectations. We've all played games where, you know, we, you tap on something or you perform an action, you really expect it to go that way, and it doesn't. And then, of course, the pre your presence is everywhere, all of us, as designers. Um, you know, one way or another, when we're designing for flow or interaction or game design, you are really informing that experience in, in ways that maybe you can't even really imagine or think of, think of until the, it, the players get at it and then you just see all of this emergent stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I spoke with a friend of mine who works for um, a big company, who, some of whom, some of you might be in the audience, I can't say who, but, you know, I think uh, it's really important as far as uh, user experience goes, if you're a user experience designer, it is relatively new in the game industry. I mean, it is, but it isn't, right? Um, but I think that it's so important to uh, try to find ways to, to build in or institutionalize um, the user experience um, sort of components in the game as much as you can in a company so that you, or so that one is not trying to get buy-in by having to, you know, have six coffee meetings <laughs> with this executive or, you know, just to get everyone on the same page. And so um, it's really, it's just important to do that. And so I've seen a lot of um, folks move towards implementing user experience guides just as much as you would have style guides for, for UI or game design document. Uh, I started this practice with some of the startups I work with now in addition to a game design document. And, it, and we have a UX guide. I, ideally, we'll have a style guide. Um, and I still push for functional specs wherever I can. <laughs> um, sometimes it's a battle. Uh, and you can really devise what that UX guide would be, a style guide would be. It's up to you, whatever fits with your organization. But I think it's really important to have this because it really does help establish buy-in. From every, and in terms of every stage of the de development. Because, you know, um, larger companies, uh, from what I understand, uh, approach this kind of thing differently. But some of the ones I've heard who do it the best have uh, a gating process, right? So, so that when the game finally hits uh, some of the key decision makers sort of on up the so-called value chain, that they're really no surprises, and everyone's bought in. And so some of the things I would recommend putting in a UX guide, and again, this would also uh, apparent, you know, fit in other documents, would be a description of the product market fit, 
um, a description of the behavioral experiences because not all behaviors are the same or valued in the same way. I'm just showing this um, very tried and true example of, of how behaviors can be viewed differently. I'm sure you're all familiar with B.J. Fogg and his behavioral matrix. B.J. Fogg is a professor at Stanford. He's been, his work has been uh, used a lot within the game industry, maybe misused. But really what I think he's done in terms of you know, our purposes here as user experience designers is he's really, he's really one of the first to really define uh, ways to differentiate different kinds of behaviors. And it's a way to really help, um, uh, it's really a way to help uh, prioritize behaviors because how many of us have sat in design or production meetings where uh, and I know there are other ways to quantify whether features are important. I know some companies are very analytical about it, which is good. But, you know, sometimes it's like, I think this feature is, we have to ship with this feature. And I think having these kinds of behavioral matric, matrices where, well, yeah, that's a really important behavior, but the user will maybe do it once, sort of late in their gameplay. And how do you value that over other kinds of of implementation. So I just think BJ Fogg is a really good place to start in terms of mapping out um, how you weight behaviors in terms of importance or relevance or critical path. Um, obviously, user personas would be another thing that would go into a UX style guide. And again, I know some of it does overlap with um, game design documents, and maybe there's a way to cross-reference it in Slack or something. Um, but these, this is an example, the one on your right is an example of a project I worked on with Lifetime Television. I forgot to mention I was there as well for a year, uh, Lifetime and History Channel and all that. And we conducted a study on women, game, women gamers and we did a lot of really cool uh, collection methods um, for the study. So we had surveys and focus groups, we had users write letters to their favorite game. I know it sounds really corny, but people really got into it. And I, it was so helpful um, for obtaining buy-in, not only from the core production team for content that we were creating, but for the SVPs and the CEOs of the various um, television channels at the time. And then, of course, UX writing is an interesting area. Uh, it's interesting because I've seen an explosion of UX writing jobs, not explosion, but I'm, I've seen quite a few more uh, open positions for UX writing jobs. And that is actually a thing, and I know it's been a thing for a while, but I really think the game industry is embracing it more. And again, I think as we become more complex in terms of the various platforms that are, there are for creating games and uh, you know, all, all that stuff, so UX writing, would also probably go in the style guide for UX guide. And then um, how expressive texts and symbols are used. Okay, I know this isn't a game, but I just thought it was funny. You know, uh, you know animated text, um, you know, symbols and how that gets used. That is also something that I think as a user experience designer, you can somewhat bake into the experience. And then of course, methods, We've you've done this, um, a lot, and uh, so I won't spend too much time on this. You know, just, just workshopping and workshopping with the target audience. This is an example of a project that we did with the American Museum of Natural History. For one of their, um, we created a, a card game. We've actually created um, an AR experience with, for them as well, or with them. Um, but this is, you know, using target, the target audience, using or inviting the target audience <laughs> to come and really help work through what the design would be and help play test that design. And it was uh, really an incredibly enriching experience. And again, um, you know, I think this has been mentioned a few times already in this, um, during this show, but we, you know, I think Erin mentioned it in her keynote where, you know, her dream is that, you know, anyone can make a game. And we are really heading in that direction. I mean, obviously anyone can make, um, uh, a game now for the most part, but I think as game designers and creators, I think we are increasingly making those tools available and I think it's just going to ex explode because we have a whole 
generation of, of kids who are familiar with games, make games already, and can code anyway, um, you know, and I think you're starting to see this even more. I mean, we see it with the Minecraft stuff too, anyway. Another method that we use that I think is really fun is a uh, card sorting method. Uh, and this is, doesn't have necessarily anything to do with the game. I, these images are not um, from one that we've done. I couldn't find images from our exercises. The card sorting exercises can be digital or they could be IRL. And, um, and really, it's just a way of, for a user experience designer to get a sense of what your target audience associates with different key, key concepts or, or um, ideas that you're playing around with and how they, uh, um, what their reaction is. So it's a good way to just sort of get a, a test on tone and just get a test on how your users view things without showing them the actual game itself. This is really early concepting. And then, this is really embarrassing, but another thing that you can do or we've done is using, using collaging as an exercise. So it, it has to do with the game, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with the game. We, we ask users to say how they feel um, when they experienced something in a game or played something, make a collage about it. So it's asking the user to, to sort of assimilate what they've experienced playing the game and sort of express it in another way artistically. And sometimes that resonates and sometimes it doesn't. I'm using this image of myself because um, I didn't want to um, show any of the other ones we had with our users because I thought that would be a little bit intrusive. But this, this, this exercise was sort of a, how did you feel before, during, and after sort of thing? This level, in this case. Uh, narrative arcs is another thing that uh, probably ought to go in a UX style guide. And uh, here's a game we did for The Walking Dead, really low budget. It was, uh, but it was on the Android best-selling, well, not best-selling, it was free, best downloaded big game. Not surprised it was, uh, it was The Walking Dead, it was a big brand, but what was really interesting about this game it was that uh, there was a moment where the character Shane, let's see if I can, oh yeah, so Shane was one of the characters in The Walking Dead. And in our narrative story, Dead Reckoning, Shane encountered his ex-girlfriend in the story. And she was in the process of turning into a zomb zombie. And so we really tried to build up the narrative to create this dy the dynamic tension in the game where Shane had to kill his girlfriend zombie, but because she was still sort of changing over to the zombie state, he was really having a, a tough time pulling the trigger because, well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he, he, he was, uh, this was a person he you know, cared about, but then she was a zombie. So. Uh, we tried to build that kind of dramatic tension into the game wherever we could. Um, one thing I want to mention here in terms of user experience that you might think is interesting, or not, is uh, there are a lot of walkthroughs for this game on YouTube. And as far as um, user experience goes, and this, could, this is uh, something that happens obviously after the fact, but wow, can you learn a lot watching people um, do video walkthroughs of your game, also with the streaming as well, but it was really uh, eye-opening. Um, and then I think this was touched on a bit yesterday, but you know, we have these general user experience tools, but then on top of that, we have um, tools that involve artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing which will hopefully give us, as user experience designers, a lot more flexibility and control and, and ability to be adaptive in terms of how we approach um, the user experience. So I won't spend too much time on this. You know, we talked yesterday about um, artificial narrow intelligence and, you know, we still have a long way to go. You know, is that a dog or a rolled up towel? Who knows? <laughs> But you know, the more we have data sets, and I will say inclusive data sets, really important, really important, um, we'll get better at this. 
And then artificial general intelligence, right, which is Westworld. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but we really are heading, you know, towards this, uh, you know, some of it's hype, but, but a lot of it isn't. And so, you know, we know as game designers, we've been using AI for a long time, you know, calculating all moves possible. Um, chess can be an adaptive type of gameplay. Field of vision triggers, we use AI all the time for that. Um, and then, you know, then we enter the world of NPCs, right? My goodness, haven't NPCs really uh, matured, you know, and really gotten quite sophisticated over time? You know, uh, you know, I know when I played Warcraft, uh, you know, there are certain NPCs I really like, certain ones I really didn't like. I know they're not real, but, um, you know, it, in some ways I still interact with them as though they're real. And, you know, uh, and I think as we get more and more sophisticated with M NPCs in terms of the AI and the adaptability, uh, I think it's going to be even more exciting to see how that unfolds. And I think there is a real world consequence for that, right? Uh, and this is sort of my mantra is that there really isn't an area of user experience design and frankly games that doesn't touch industry or the world in some way or another. And so I remember um, even to this day, um, you know, I spend a lot of, a lot of time on Twitter, too much time. Uh, but, you know, the bots really um, confuse people. You know, people think that the bots are real. And, I mean, not just, you know, you or me, but, you know, uh, you know, public officials. You know, folks get really fooled into thinking these very simple scripted or adaptive bots are real. And, you know, I was really good at identifying bots on Twitter. And I'm losing my ability to do that because they're getting so good and so sophisticated. Um, and I think as user experience designers, we really have to think about that. Um, and then, you know, there is the whole idea of bots as mediators as well. And this is another project that I'm involved in, not this image. Um, I'm not allowed to show this one. And this one I was a little bit worried about showing um, because it's still in progress. But, uh, you know, we, we, we're really willing to suspend our disbelief as users, whether it's with an NPC or with, with a bot character um, or a bot uh, in tw on Twitter, for example. And then um, there's, a, there's a project that I'm involved in. It's also another, um, it's a National Inter Institute of Mental Health project from the uh, United States government funded project. And it's a, it's a, it's basically uh, a, an app that has gamified elements to it that is for kids, for teenagers who have been through the um, justice system and have what we call severe conduct behavioral disorder. And uh, it's a pretty intense app and, you know, it's like, uh, uh, it's, and it's um, using something called uh, multi-systemic therapy. And it's really just a way to keep the kid, the, the, the teen, out of jail. And so it's like, use this or you might go back to, to juvenile hall. <laughs> and it's not funny, but um, it's kind of intense because basically it's an app that, uh, base, that where the parents and the caregivers interact with the teen to sort of not only keep tabs on where they are throughout the day, yes, some have compared it to an electronic ankle bracelet, um, and there's also a geofencing aspect to the app where if, um, if, a, if a teen is sort of at school at 5 p.m., they're not really supposed to be there at 5 p.m., and so the, the parent or the guardian is notified. Um, the, the, the teen earns points. I know it's a little reductive. The teen earns points for, um, for being, being good, <laughs> so to speak. And then at the end of a certain time, they can cash in those points to do things like maybe, you know, do whatever they want, like go to the movies or what have you. If the teen wants to stay out later, um, this is where I think this is, a, to me, a really cool design. Uh, they don't ask the parent, if they're using the app, they don't ask the parent directly. They will communicate that to a bot mediator. The bot has some cute little name, some, it's a character. The bot will act as a, as a medi mediator between the parent and the child in terms of negotiating the time 
um, that the, the teen can uh, return home and it'll still be okay. And I think to me, that's a uh, really, really powerful use of bots as uh, a facilitator of user experience. Another thing I think is interesting about this population of, of kids or teens uh, that I said a few times in a job interview, I don't think it was a good idea. You know, as, as game designers and as user experience designers, we're, we're concerned with flow, we're concerned with things like reward schedules, right? And one thing I learned working with this population is that um, in comparison to, you know, your users at large, if you just constantly are rewarding a user, right? Just constantly. You're great, you're great, you get a star, you get a star, right? It gets really boring. It doesn't feel meaningful after a while. It kind of, I mean, it wears me down. It's just as bad as being constantly penalized for something, right? It's just not a good user experience. But with certain groups of, of, of users, um, the reward schedule has to be much more frequent, much more robust, and in some ways you can't pile on enough rewards to keep um, a, a user engaged, and that was the case with this, with this uh, population. Um, and <laughs> the thing I said that didn't win me points in, in the job interview was that I said, um, uh, they found that it's the same with psychopaths. <laughs> Psychopaths need constant reward schedules, which is true, because uh, a lot of the teens who don't, um, who don't necessarily uh, kind of get out of this phase, the severe conduct behavioral dis phase, will eventually be classified as psychopaths. But just in general, <laughs> just try not to mention psychopaths too much and reward schedules, because I think it's a little bit alienating. But I, I do think this is something that's really fascinating. I, it's heading into um, the commercial marketplace soon. It, the first phase of this project already went through clinical trials, and um, it involves a lot of um, different folks, not only the cognitive behavioral therapists who are really spearheading this effort, but a lot of um, uh, different uh, juvenile court jurisdictions are really going to be adopting this product um, with any luck, or maybe not. Uh, but you know, we've even, so, so take that, right? So we're on Twitter, uh, or we're interacting with an NPC, and you know, we're suspending disbelief, and you know, sometimes, even if we know they're not real, I know I'll, I'll emote uh, interacting with NPCs, for example, sometimes. Now take that one step further, where, um, where avatars are now completely realistic, or really just getting to the point of of uncanny realism. And that was what was just announced at the Oculus conference just the other day. And I think we're increasingly moving into a space where um, I don't want to, you know, say the real and the unreal, the, the lines are blurring. But I mean, the lines are blurring, right? And, uh, and then as user experience designers, you're also going to have to contend with with uh, you know, the interaction not only with just the bots or the NPCs, now we're actually playing games with robots, right? And I, I'm sure you've all seen Anki. Oh, okay, this is, one of my, this is one of my favorite things in the whole world. And they're in San Francisco, so Anki was founded, I think, by some MIT scientists who specialize in robotics. They are doing a whole s bunch of different things. Um, I think they raised a ton of money. I don't know too much about that. I, I visited there, but I, don't, I haven't kept track of it. But they have a product right now out there on the market called Anki. Anki is this cute little robot, and they um, are available for 179 US dollars. Sorry to be US-centric with that. And you can play games with Anki. Uh, Anki, uh, learns your, your, um, to read your expressions on some level. And it isn't as obvious here, but Anki also has this sort of like screen where its eyes, his or her, its eyes emote. And from what I understand, the company hired um, designers from Pixar to design this here. And Anki has the cutest little noises that it makes. And it feels real. And you know, when I, th 
think about what my experience working at PF Magic on those virtual pets. Our users thought those pets were real too. I mean, they knew they weren't. But you know, we would have adult people say, I think my pet can hear my, my stereo, the music playing on my stereo, because my pet was dancing. No, that was just an animation cycle that just happened to sync with the music that we were playing in the background. But it just, again, the context created the conditions whereby the adult player, um, the adult player uh, felt that was happening. So Anki is super cool. I, was, I would recommend it, and they also have um, kits where you can create your own games. Uh, and then, of course, I always turn back to, to my favorite shows. So Mr. Robot. So Mr. Robot, I don't, it's a show about, oh, you know, hacking and dystopia. But this is a scene where one of the characters, oops, this is a scene where one of the characters was in bed having a conversation with Alexa. Because basically the whole story is, you know, she's, She's an FBI agent, she, all she does is work, she doesn't really have any friends, but Alexa is there. So again, it's that, that blurring of, of reality. And then sensors, right? Now, as user experience designers, you're gonna be increasingly working with sensor technology, right? Um, whether that's heart rate, whether that's in real, you know, whether you have the ability as a user to, or as a designer to um, either automate gameplay so that it responds to things like a heart rate. So if you're doing a fitness game, maybe you'll have dynamic difficulty adjustment built into the game because you can see your user's uh, heart rate is going above 150 and that's not good for a person with their age or whatever their, their um, situation is. Uh, here's a project I worked on. Um, it's in clinical trials right now. Can't show it. Um, probably not allowed to show this either. Too bad. <laughs> Sue me? Uh, they won't, just kidding. But this is a, another National Institute of Health um, game uh, that we did. It was, um, but as you can see, this is kind of a tried and true tower defense style game, right? But we had the added a complexity as game designers and as user experience designers to have a carbon monoxide detector that works with the game. So imagine all the complexity as a user experience designer that arises when you're not only having to make this game, make it playable, make it understandable, but then it has to work with this other third-party technology. Uh, and you know, how do you ensure the readings are going to be accurate? Because if you successfully show that you have been abstaining from smoking cigarettes, this is a tobacco um, cessation game, smoking cessation game, um, you earn points in the game. Now, whether that's an effective way to encourage people to quit smoking, it takes the average adult seven times to quit smoking successfully. Um, but imagine all that complexity. What if uh, this gentleman here you know, used his, his um, bed font meter, that's what that is, breathalyzer, or smokealyzer, and he really was abstaining, he wasn't smoking, but something went wrong between here and there, right? Terrible user experience, just terrible. And as game designers, we're going to have more and more of these sensors to, at our, at our ex disposal, whether it's for the healthcare industry or just for entertainment, right? Um, you know, especially, I think, in the VR realm. I think we're going to see a lot more um, of the sensor technology come into play, potentially, is my, my thinking. And then, obviously, AR, same deal. I know that's not a game, but <laughs> VR, obviously. And then, of course, a lot of the executives, they all care about, with good reason, the bottom line. And I think as user experience designers, the more that, you know, depending on where you, where you are, where you work, or um, the more that we can show that user experience contributes to the bottom line, revenues, uh, engagement, I think um, the stronger case we have that, you know, we rule. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but, but I mean, it just, it just, it just creates a more solid reason that user experience has to be something that's considered from the outset, right? Of course, context is everything. Uh, so think about voice control, right? I'm so excited about voice control. Like, just in general, I think it's super exciting. Not only voice chat for games, but just voice activated games. So like we see this, here's one example, when in Rome, I don't know if you've seen this recently. But it's an Alexa, it's an Alexa voice activated game that has a board game component. 
super cool, right? And I was telling my friend Tom, who works at EA the other day over brunch, I was like, I'm so excited about boys. I'm going to make some voice games. He's like, oh, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? You know, and his reasons were right, because context is everything. Sure, playing this is fine, right? But you know, if I'm on the subway <laughs> and I'm trying to use voice, right, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's uh, intrusive. You don't want to do it. So again, um, user experience within context is everything. And then, of course, uh, data sets are important. You know, Google did this really cool, is your portrait in a museum? And early on, they were getting some feedback from folks that I'm not represented here. So, uh, you know, you hold up your phone, it takes your photo and it says, this is who you look like um, in terms of art, you know, in the museum. And some people were getting, sorry, there's no match for you. <laughs> and, and users said to Google, uh, hey, this is an issue. And so uh, I think Google's done a really good job of trying to address inclusivity around AI, around data sets. Um, and I've noticed that, that this has really improved over time. And Google has also done a really great job around creating neural networks um, around how users draw and interpret symbols. And I'm sure you've all seen Quick Draw, right, where you were asked to um, can a neural network learn to recognize a doodle? So you were given an, uh, a word, you had to draw it, and then the neural network had to guess what you were drawing. And I'm sure this has gone up, but at the time when I created the slide, there were 50 million um, data variables that Google had collected. It's probably 100 million now or something. Really great, really awesome project. We've come a long way. Okay. But still, I've been in the game industry for so long. Um, 5% of leadership positions in the tech industry are held by women. And uh, it's an issue. Need to fix that. Um, you know, and UX at, at its best hides the fact that life is messy. Right, life is messy. Um, you know, I, had, I do podcasting as a hobby. And I realized um, listening to edited conversation is so much more interesting than listening to the raw footage. And I was like, well, how much of our lives, our user experiences are, are messy versus edited. And, and how does that really change? You know, at, growing up in the United States, raised on television, everything is solved in a half an hour television program. You know, that's edited life. And that doesn't really reflect real life. And I worry that a lot of the abilities that we have in tech and games, um, while it, it makes our user experience more pleasant because it does hide some of those messy factors, I would, um, you know, so for example, this is something that was in the news recently about um, micro expressions and um, that companies are increasingly using AI to look at uh, a user's um, face and how they smile and what words they use. And um, because it just, you know, because they want to find the perfect candidate, but, you know, are we fitting ourselves in too much of a box? Are we boxing ourselves in? Life gets interesting at the, at the edges, right? At the, at the blurry edges where innovation happens. Um, so that's one of the things I want to say is just, and, you know, embrace the, embrace the messiness as user experience designers because it does have a place. It does have a place. Um, we know that with the whole um, randomness and game design principle, right? Like when you get a random thing happen that isn't expected, it creates a sense of joy or dismay, depending. And, uh, and I think it's just in general, something as user experience designers, because really there's no aspect of games or user experience design that doesn't, I mean, it touches so many aspects of our lives. And I, I just, you know, I've worked for government, for banks, for uh, healthcare, everything, and user experience is built into it, you know, whether we know it, whether we like it or not, you know, checking in at an airport, it's a user experience, not a good one. Uh, and then Mel Melissa Concelier, I think, I hope I'm pronouncing name properly, I was really impressed when, when you said, you know, UXify the UX process for your team, right? Really resonated with me because that's part of it, right? That's part of it. Uh, and so this last slide is blank because really I want to put this forward to you. Um, we really are touching every aspect of, of the world 
in, in terms of experiences. You know, military people are recruiting gamers to, uh, to control drones. They look for folks like that. Uh, people look at Warcraft guilds for people who are strong with leadership skills. Bing Gordon loves talking about that in Silicon Valley. So I leave this blank because I just want to say, you know, this is the future, uh, your future. What do you want it to be for you? What kind of industry do you want to see for yourselves? You know, all those people I started out with, they're, they're not in games anymore. And why, why is that? Maybe for some good reasons. But, you know, um, but, may, but maybe not. And, um, you know, do you want to be in the game industry in, like, in 10 or 20 years? Or, you know, or how will you take that out to the world, what you do, into other areas of endeavor and learning and experience? And so I really invite you, this is your industry. You own it. So please, please take advantage of it. And there's no one more suited to do that than the people in this room. So I think we probably ran out of time for questions. Five minutes. I don't know if there are any questions based on them, but I just. <laughs> and I won't be hurt if you don't have any. I know it's the end of the day. Is somebody walking towards the mic? I'm scared. No. Just kidding. <laughs> no. Hi. Hi. I have many feelings. We should talk after this. I'm basically in games because of you. Um, but. As I've said, I'm also an educator. And uh, recently at Bungie, we've been talking about how we can attract more female uh, game designers. And uh, I looked at our leaders and I said, I taught 90 students this last summer, and only three of them were women. So we can try as hard as we can to recruit, but they just aren't there. Do you, and so I've been struggling with the question of how do we get people in these programs? Like, what is it that, like, why? Because <laughs> to me, it's fascinating, interesting, and I'm a woman, and I love it, and I don't see why all the women everywhere aren't trying to, like, get in this field. So what, what do you think? I think it's a twofold answer, and I, I honestly thank you for your question. And I don't have all the answers, and I, but I do have two thoughts that immediately come to, to mind. One is a friend of mine, Peter Glover, uh, said, it's not a pipeline problem, it's a doorbell problem, OK? So, um, so I, I see it two different ways. Uh, you know, I think that um, in terms of, a, of a, having more students co come in, I mean, I think there are a lot, I mean, there are a lot of game, design, um, game designers who are women and UX designers who are women. And I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's possible for them to get into the industry if, uh, and again, this is what I was talking about, the sloppy edges, you know. We, we um, recruiters and people who hire, they're so, I'm going to just say it, they're so afraid to take chances on people. You know, I've, I've hired and fired, I mean, I've hired hundreds of people, scores of people in my life, maybe not hundreds, you know, and there are people I've taken chances on, and no, they don't fit into this box, and you know what, that's a good thing, and so I just think, you know, I, I can say to you all the things like go to the schools and you know, go to these uh, black girls code groups and all that, and, and they are out there, and, and definitely speak with them. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know I, I worry about the use of AI for hiring people because I just feel like it's, uh, we're all just expected to just fit in these boxes. And I think people just have to learn to take chances. Middle managers have to stop being afraid um, uh, to protect their own jobs and just open it up. And, and maybe you mess up. Maybe you just don't hire the right people. I've hired really senior people who have great credentials, and they were terrible. And uh, so just, just take the chance. I mean, it's at will employment, at least in the States. You can fire them. You know, but just, and I know, like, smaller teams, you, you want, you want, um, you, you can't take those chances. I understand you know, one rat and apple spoils, you know, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, you just have to really take a chance. And, you know, I call it the meritocracy. Um, you know, we say tech is a meritocracy, and I say it's a meritocracy. It's like um, you don't have to hire the five-year younger version of yourself, okay? And then the other thing I believe, it's a pipeline problem. It's not a pipeline problem. It's a doorbell problem. 
I really sincerely believe, and it's not just women, I think it's people of color, I think it's any of us who don't fit in that, you know, I went to Pepperdine, you know. Uh, we really need more women and d diverse communities at, at senior levels. And really, until that gets fixed and addressed, until you have SVP or higher, and I'm not trying to be elitist, it has to be the executive group, but honestly, you need more representation at the higher levels of the executive chain because it's not gonna change anywhere else. They have to change. <laughs> Ugh. It's, it's just, um, it's just so, it's such, such a missed opportunity for all of us. And, I, and, and you know, all of you, we've all been there. We, I mean, that's why I started my own companies. It's because I just knew I just wasn't going to get much, much higher than a certain level, which is fine. But, you know, like I said, all those other people I started off with, they're not in games anymore. And I'm still here, for better or for worse, I'm still here. So I really think it's, it's a twofold issue. I think it's just um, not talking to your buddy to recommend somebody. I mean, that's good too. But, but, um, but also, in sh you know, because the people at the so-called top, they're the ones who are doling out the money. They control the money. And let's face it, who controls the money controls a lot of what happens. And so you, you need to fund, fund um, that and have um, more say at those levels. Anyway, I feel pretty strongly about it, as you can tell. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hi. Uh, so this is a question on the NIMH project. Uh, I think it's a question that's going to come up more and more for game designers. Uh, but I'm interested in your really broad experience. Uh, how, how you consider the ethical implications of uh, working on you know, coercive uh, things that are meant to coerce real world behavior for captive audiences, essentially? Yeah, well, uh, all culture is persuasion. I mean, uh, there's a glib response. Um, no, it's something I think about a lot, um, especially with the geofencing app, right? And the people behind it, I could say, they're the nicest people in the world, and they are, and they really are committed. But it is an ethical consideration. And, uh, you know, when I started in games, nobody wanted to be in the game industry. Uh, but now we're, we're, we're finding that we're, <laughs> for lack of a better way. I mean, we kind of, we kind of rule. Like, everything, everything is derived, a lot of things are derived out of the game industry. Uh, you know, I worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some things I won't do, some hard lines I won't do. Um, the ethics of the, the geofencing app, I felt like was, I could reconcile it with myself because I felt like, it was better than putting um, these, these kids through in jail, essentially. Um, it was preferable. But, you know, uh, I guess I have some hard lines. I won't work for the tobacco industry, for example. Um, I don't think saying it's a personal decision is a, is a satisfactory answer to what you're saying. Um, you know, but I think that's sort of what, what I've been doing. That's a very good question. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time. I know it's the end of the day.